Okay, so um, I don't want to delay um, things too long. I'm sure people will slowly uh, join us, but um, uh, I, I think it's good if we start on time. So um, welcome uh, to uh, the, this session, which is the uh, WDS ORCID Strategic Workshop Adoption of PIDs in Asia Oceana. Um, so the chairs are myself, myself, Rory Edmonds. I'm the acting executive director of the, the World Data System, and uh, WDS. And Estelle Cheng is um, is the APAC engagement manager of, of Orchid, um, and so we will be chairing this, this session. And we are joined in this first half, uh, well, throughout, but especially in this first half by who uh, by two moderators. Um, Professor Hideaki Takeda um, of uh, the, the National, uh, National Institute of Informatics uh, in Japan and Professor Masao Mori of uh, Tokyo, the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Um, so we thank, thank them for, for helping us moderate the discussion. So um, first, a tiny bit of housekeeping. Um, we did have some issues earlier on today with, um, with bandwidth. Um, so we would ask that generally, um, unless people are presenting, to, um, to actually turn their videos off. Um, we would also um, ask, like to ask people to um, uh, use, uh, to mute themselves uh, and to use the chat for, for questions. Um, the moderators may, may ask you to, to open your mic um, if, uh, if they um, decide that that's, uh, you know, uh, useful. But in general, we would ask people to keep themselves muted um, uh, unless they're, they're presenting or, or invited to, uh, to ask a question. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have um, three hours here and we've split it up into two, uh, the, this workshop up into two halves. So the first half is um, part one, which we're, we're in now, is a PIDs, uh, a, a vital component of global research data infrastructure. And here we, we've got three um, high level talks um, to introduce three different uh, persistent identifier systems. We thought, um, uh, you know, it would be useful to present uh, the context of, of three different PID systems. So um, first of all, we will have um, Estelle Cheng um, from ORCID talking about um, the ORCID um, ID. Uh, which is for uh, researchers or uh, permanent uh, persistent identifiers for people. Um, and then we have um, uh, Masashi Hara, um, who is from the Japan Link Center, and he will be talking about um, uh, DOIs, dig uh, digital object identifiers. So basically persistent identifiers for um, uh, re digital research objects. Um, and then we also have um, Jens Klump, who will be talking about the IGSN, and this is actually um, a, a persistent identifier for physical um, research output, so mainly samples. So this is so this is the first half of the session. Um, each presenter has a 20 minutes, including questions. Um, we're hoping that there'll be a little bit of time for questions at the, each, at the end of each presentation, but we also have a little bit of time at the end for, for a more general discussion. Um, so without further ado, I don't want, again, I don't want to delay us, um, so I will stop sharing my screen. Um, and Estelle, um, maybe uh, you can already get going. So the first talk uh, today is um, by Estelle Cheng of, of ORCID. Estelle is the APAC engagement manager, and she'll be talking about uh, adopting persistent identifiers in open research infrastructure ORCID and beyond. So um, please yeah. take it away. Thank you, Rory. So hello, everyone. Can you see my screen and hear me? I can, so I'm assuming okay. everybody else can. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, of course. Yeah, so thank you, Rory, for a brief but concise introduction. I want to thank you again for Dr. Takeda and Dr. Mori to help moderate this session. So, hi, yeah, hello, everyone. Thank you for your time joining here. So I'm still 
I'm Chechi Estogen. I'm the APEC Orchid Engagement Manager. So today I'm very happy to share a bit more about adopting persistent, persistent identifiers like ORCID in open research infrastructure. So today's presentation, I will cover three dimensions. First, I want to briefly introduce research infrastructure, the value of identifiers in terms of interoperability. And next, I'm going to share a bit more about ORCID community and last, I also want to illustrate some ORCID use cases in terms of best practice to adopt ORCID or PITs in research data sharing or management process. I want to briefly begin by stating ORCID's vision again. So ORCID's vision is a world where all who participate in research, scholarship, and innovation are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions, affiliations across time, disciplines and borders. So uh, I think in the today's symposium and also in yesterday's session, uh, it's generally a consensus that research infrastructure is essential in terms of enable data fair principle. So identifiers actually can help to enable that on a global scale. I would like to begin by imagine a perfect world where research information or data is openly available and researchers can could be accurately credited and the research institutions can be accurately cited as well. Vendors can track impact. Publishers can streamline submission and review process and there is there are accurate research search and discovery tools and the researchers can easily share information if they want and the evaluators have access to open data. And this perfect ideal world actually requires a well-implemented strategy so as to research uh, data management. So, sorry, I see a chat there. Just let me click. Okay. Keep going. So yeah, so those well when well implemented strategy uh, is essential to support uh, the research infrastructure and to support a uh, good research data management or sharing. So open information structure is needed uh, for creation to trusted linkages between researcher, research institutions, publishers, data centers, and funding organizations. So the value of Identifiers pits like ORCID for people, researchers, and the research organization registry for places and the DOI for data sets are really fundamental in anchoring and referencing information in a trusted and interoperable way. Here are a few uh, examples of different identifiers for people, places, and things. So probably some of you know Scopus ID or Research ID and of course ORCID, although we are all people IDs, but we serve different purposes and different scope. And for DOI sets like Cross of Data Site or Japan Link Center, here I want to bring a more a closer look at exactly what is ORCID. So ORCID is a global, unique and open identifier for researchers or for people who contribute to research. And the researchers can share their ID with organizations during workflows. And ORCID is a place to store and share those resulting connections between IDs and activities or affiliations. Next, I'm going to give a couple of examples of different uh, resulting connections that can be done and stored at ORCID. So this is the example from New Zealand Royal Society. So they connect affiliation information to researchers ORCID account. And this is the information, uh, this is the example from Chang'e University in Taiwan. So they connect funding information. And you can also connect personal identifiers. This is actually the example in Japan. So it's viable to connect your local or national ID here. So this is uh, the example from research and resource ID in Japan from Takeda-san's research records. And this is a connection from works. So you can connect professional activities to the researcher's account. This is the example from Yonsei University Medical Library in Korea. And this is an example from uh, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. They connect their nation uh, institutional ID as well. They, they, are prof they got a prof professional profile system. 
And uh, also at this point, I want to spend a little bit more time uh, speaking about research resources, which uh, are really special equipment, facilities, or collections that researchers use to generate data sets. And those resources, uh, sometimes they are not really exposed in research outputs, but they are very important in terms of transparency and reprodu reproducibility, also about funding stuff. So this is, uh, so research resources are not only just about you know equipments, uh, laboratory observations, ships. It's also uh, can be like digital repositories are also counted as a part of them, and also from museums or galleries. And this is an example from EMSL from the US. And this is another example from XSEDE also from the US. So making, identifying those research resources uh, will help make your resources citable and you can share information about the research at your facility and improves transparency between research, research users and resources. This is the diagram to pick interoperability, just give you a more general idea how this happened. So we all start from researchers having an OKID first and those different organizations in the research workflow, they can benefit from that. So for instance, so publishers, they can collect validated data pushed by employer or funders about funding or affiliation information to their local publishing system to use. But at the same time, they can also connect validated data, publication data, or uh, publication in terms of data sets to research or key records like a hub. This will enable the information flow automatically and in a more trusted and transparent way. And they also improve data quality. In the next section, I'm going to introduce a little bit more about ORCID community. So how ORCID community collaborates to uh, build an open infrastructure together. This is the ORCID team. And this is the ORCID APEC team. So in addition to myself, I got two other com colleagues in the APEC region. And ORCID is a nonprofit membership and platform neutral organizations. We are suspended by members from different uh, organizations like publishers, funders, data centers, research institutes. And ORCID is governed by representatives from the board. Now we got more than 9 million researchers have an ORCID ID, and we got more than 1,000 member organizations in uh, across 50 countries, including 24 national consortia. And now there are more than 600 research systems using ORCID. And in this slide, just to give you a more general impression about how ORCID is doing in the APEC. So we got 150 members in total. We got 129 integrations. Those systems connected with ORCID. We got four national consortia from Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and Taiwan. And I would like to stress that in terms of pets, uh, in general, we work very closely with three DOIRs here in Asia. So it's Arity in Taiwan, Japan Link Center in Japan, and KIST in Korea. And also we work uh, two local service providers, the research management service pro uh, research management system providers in Japan is Atlas, Atlas S2ID and DB Spiral. And uh, there is a growing trend across uh, around the globe that they integrate identifiers like ORCID into their national platforms or national policy or national infrastructure. And uh, our consortia is a major driving force for this. So for, who, for those who of you, uh, for those who may not be familiar with ORCID consortia, so ORCID consortia are groups of five or more nonprofit organizations taking a coordinated approach to implement ORCID. So there are four good examples I want to share. So the first one is from Australia. So a joint statement of principle has been issued to strongly support the use of ORCID and also into its open access policy. And in Italy, they launched uh, the Italian Research Identifier for Evaluation. And in New Zealand, they built the New Zealand ORCID Hub to promote uh, ORCID use. And in UK, there, are, uh, there have been reports to see key benefits 
for improving efficiency in using orchid or pets. So from now on, I am going to share some more use cases. What are the best practices for working with orchid or connected with orchid into, to enable a better research data management and sharing? So here I want to begin with some general data repositories. So those general data repository platforms are really one of the key components in research data management or sharing. And back in 2018, Orchid works with a, a couple of repository experts across the countries to develop recommendations for data repository platforms. Now we are working to advocate adoption of this into different repository platforms and workflows. Now, some examples of repositories supporting ORCID include Dryad, Fixture, or DSpace. So here is, uh, I want to go into more details about if you are interested or if your data repository are interested in working with ORCID, how to do, what to do. So basically to, to enable that, you connect your system with ORCID by ORCID API and into five actions. So first, you invite researchers either create and share their OK ID with you during your management or sharing or research data workflow. It's called authenticate. And then, of course, you display your OK ID in your system. And then you can be able to collect data, get data from ORCID to help populate your system. And also you can connect your data in terms of affiliations, contributions, or works, or even research resources to make those data more um, widely circulated, being more interoperable and findable. And last is about synchronization. You can add data or get data from ORCID on an ongoing basis. I want to quickly recap the benefits in terms of organizations. So there are three parts. So this is really about you can collect different data from various resources. Okay, it's a community-driven organization. So we work with our members and partners, including DOA providers, vendors, service providers, publishers. And also you can con contribute connect, connecting validate data from your system to ORCID to make those to be more findable and interoperable worldwide. And of course, in this regard, it's uh, expected you can enjoy a more automated and information sharing process and across to interoperability. This is the illustration about uh, practical use cases. Actually, this is achieved through a joint effort among different PEDS providers from DOI and to ORCID. So now ORCID works this to, with these three DOI agencies to help this uh, come true. So basically, the auto-update feature or function means that first researchers connect their ORCID ID to manuscript process or when they are going to submit their data for deposit, uh, for deposit for de to depository for archiving service purposes. And then those publishers and data centers, when they are going to apply for DOIs, they embed these ORCID IDs into the metadata. And when this DOI agency, they issue DOIs to those data sets, they have the authenticated ORCID ID. And then they can, based on the ORCID ID, they can share, they can push those uh, data set information or publication information to those researchers' ORCID records. And in, it enables time savings for researchers, it preserves metadata quality, and it supports better transparency and trust. Researchers can spend more time doing research instead of you know, managing those different uh, research management. And this is another case I want to illustrate. It's from the University of Cambridge. It's actually based on the show we just mentioned as well. And this is from an institutional or university perspective. So in University of Cambridge, they got their research management system called, they use sympathetic elements and they invite researchers to share ORCID ID there. And then they got their research repository called Apollo based on the open source DSpace repository. And through there, they, the ORCID IDs, they have 
the, those authenticated IDs, they can flow from Simplac Deep Elements to Apollo, the repository, and Huaiming for GOIs. So again, they enjoy it. The auto update feature can be applied. So the metadata of the work is pushed by data site to the OK registry using ORCID's features we just described. And also I want to mention that there are more and more universities, especially in the Asia part, like uh, Hong Kong University and the Singapore Management University. Now they adopt Figshare, which uh, to enable that happen. So basically those are also another some good, great examples to see how PITs can work together to enable a more transparent and convenient data sharing process. Here, and I also want to briefly mention an upcoming event for your friends, for those who uh, want to learn more about PITs persistent identifiers. So there is going to be an event on 2021st, January 27th, called Peter Palooza. It's actually really the event to invite different uh, people or different uh, uh, contributors working in this field to chat and to discuss, to e exchange their uh, progress in terms of persistent identifiers, regardless it's regional and national or even you know, your own initiative. So I look forward to seeing you there. I'm in the organizing committee. Yeah, last, I want to summarize by, so I think uh, we all agree that we have a vision. We want that vision to become reality. So each part of the community must participate first. You build and you benefit instead, instead of you just want to receive something. So each of us have the, re have the power to renovate the current uh, situation and we can build the infrastructure together to enable research data to be processed, archived, interpreted, published, and made available for use in a more transparent and trusted way. And thank you for your attention. And here are some of the links. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Rory, do you want to take it over? Uh, I have nothing to say other than thank you so much for a very interesting presentation and I'll, I'll let uh, Takada-san and, and uh, Mori-san um, continue. Okay, um, okay, everyone, so if you have a question, please write so uh, uh, a chat space uh, or even so uh, raise a hand. So uh, now have a, uh, have a couple of minutes so, uh, uh, for questions for her. Anybody so now? Of course, we have also discussion time in the end of this uh, session. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, let me kick, kick off. Uh, okay, and um, now so I know so um, an organization ID, uh, ROR, so ROR is, is going on. So uh, uh, how about so uh, uh, connection to uh, ROR? Is there any progress about so? Uh, uh, connection uh, between two IDs? Yeah, thank you Takeda-san. Yeah, it's a very important question and actually it's, we are being asked quite often and uh, so far there are several organi organizational IDs or his supported, so like LEI or GRID ID or Ringo ID, but we are working on making, uh, we are working on to support ROR very soon. I think it's something we are planning to be down or to achieve that in 2021st. So I will say not yet, but it's on the way. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> we are quite interesting so, uh, about this. Mm. Okay, any, any other question now? So, uh, mm. Doesn't look like it, does it? Well, we'll, we'll move on. So um, yeah. obviously if people do have questions that they think of as we're going through, um, please do put them in the chat and, and, um, and we will spend time at the end, hopefully um, to, to, to discuss more generally about, uh, about the, the, the three talks. So let's, let's move swiftly on. So our, our next talk is um, by uh, Masashi Hara um, from the Japan Science and Technology Agency. Um, and uh, Hara-san will be uh, talking about the Japan Link Center, uh, JALP. Um, so, and the title of his talk is uh, Japan DOIRA, 
Japan uh, Link Center JALC and its collaboration with ORCID. Um, so if you can share your screen, oh, already doing so, um, and please go ahead when you're ready, uh, Harasan. You're muted, Harasan. Ah, yes, can you hear me? Okay. We can indeed, and we can see your screen beautifully. Okay, thank you, Loris Edmondson. And uh, firstly, I'd like to appreci appreciate to the organizers of this workshop for giving me this opportunity. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Masashi Hara, working in JST, Japan Science and Technology Agency. Uh, also, I am in charge of Japan Link Center, so called JARUK, a registration agency of DOI in Japan. Uh, which is the uh, main topic of this talk. I'd like to introduce myself and my organization a little bit first. Uh, JST is uh, one funding agency in Japan, uh, which is top-down approach or policy-oriented uh, oriented one. And JST also has some businesses of information services, research DBs, so-called research map, uh, journal platform, so called JSTage, and so on. It might be original or unusual that one organization has these two different businesses. I myself had worked in the funding division more than 10 years, and now I work for child uh, information section. Today, such as titles, I'd like to talk about JALUK and its collaboration with ORCID from the view of to these businesses. Okay. So this slide shows that researchers' activities and related PIDs. Uh, researchers' activities are, for example, to submit new papers to publishers, uh, to apply to new research grants or new positions, or to report outputs to funding agencies and belonging organizations. Nowadays, uh, each part each part has a, its PID, such as ORCID, grant ID, DOA, DOI, and so on. And PIDs may help access to accurate information, facilitate to distribute research contents globally, improve data reliability, and so on. So in my talk, I focus on DOI, JALC, and ORCID from next slide. Firstly, also many of you may know about DOI very well, but I, I'd like to explain a little bit. Uh, DOI is an acronym for Digital Object Identifier, and DOI consists of two components, prefix and suffix, separated by the slash. And you can see DOIs in journal articles, conference papers, and uh, references, and so on, as well, uh, and so on. And DOI has two uh, related to DOI is managed by two types of organizations. One is DOI Foundation, it was funded in 1998, and another is registration, registration agency. So DOI Foundation manages registry registration agencies and make policies. But the DOI Foundation does not register DOIs. And registration agencies, now there are 11, 11 and, and it is uh, described logos, uh, right, right side. And RAs registers DOIs by their policy and prefix and keep DOIs. Also, they manage DOI registrants and publicize DOI system. 
Mm. And this slide shows the distribution of numbers registered by each RF. Already more than 220 million DOIs have been registered. Half of them is by cross F, and you can see others in the left side of the graph. JALC has about 6 million DOIs and it's equivalent to 3% of 220 million DOIs. So, from this slide, I'd like to move on to Japan Link Center, JALC. Uh, JALC is the only registration agency in Japan it was approved by the DOI Foundation in 2012. JALC registers DOIs for Japanese digital academic contents such as academic journal articles, books, research data, e-learning. JALC is governed by four institutions in Japan, JST, National Institute for Material Science, NIMS, uh, National Institute of Informatics, NII, and National Diet Library, NDL. Currently, there are about 50 regular members and more than 2,000 associate members. This is a framework of the organization, organization operating DOIs with JALC. Regular members can register DOIs through JALC and associate members must pass through regular members when registering their DOIs. And there are three ways to register DOIs through JALC. Uh, our ja regular members and associate members can register JALC DOIs as well as cross DOIs through JALC and data site DOIs through JAL. This slide shows the uh, transition of regular and associate members. From the start in 2012, it, it is gradually increasing. Uh, for example, regular members are very variety, variable. From a sort of platformers such like NII, JSTAGE, and NDL, or governmental research institutions and private companies like publishers or research institutions. And this shows the transition of the number of three types of DOIs. JALC DOI and CrossF DOI through JALC and data site DOI through JALC so JALC DOI now more than 6 million and CrossF DOI through JALC is more than 2 million and data size about 2,000, 3,000. There are some events where numbers have jumped up like 2018, 2019 or 2015. It, uh, big, for example, like big publisher started to use JALC and NDL uh, diet uh, library started to register new type of content and so on. Uh, here is the DOI registration count by content. Journal articles account for 80% and books for 15-60%, which together make up the majority as 90%. 98%. And research data, e-learning materials, and other contents accounts remaining just 2%. So I switch to explain about the new function with ORCID. Uh, it was released this uh, spring, uh, last April and May. So the purpose of this new function is to connect two parts, which are in the research activity uh, picture, which was in the first slide.
And this slide was already uh, exp explained by Esther, so I skipped it. And this is a, a new explanation about the new function with ORCID. So this function makes it possible to add information about your works, uh, which have registered JALUC DOI to your ORCID works record. You can add your works in just three steps. Um, there are two ways. One is an auto-update function that is set to automatically add to ORCID, and the other is a search and link function that adds content to ORCID one by one. So this will bring you three benefits. It can be done with ease, and the information transferred should be accurate, and this function will save time. So this is a summary of usage after the release uh, this spring. Search and links function was used more than 4,000 and more than 10,000 counts logged to login to JALC through ORCID. However, the, the auto update function is registered by very few users. You can see also further information here. Uh, it is the last slide of my talk, and although it is uh, my personal opinion, as a future perspective uh, of our service in JALC, we are willing to bring more services utilizing DOIs and to connect DOIs with other PIDs and to reduce researchers' burden and to make research environment better. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, a little bit early. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harrison. Uh, maybe you can turn on your camera briefly so that people can see you and, and recognize you. Um, it's a, okay. a future reference. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, should, uh, I should remember to do the same. Um, uh, so I, I, put, I have a put, uh, question, but I'll, I'll let um, uh, Mori-san and, and Takeda-san sort of uh, lead things first. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, not, not so a uh, question yet. Okay, um, so I can sort of understand from the historical context why um, most of the DOIs are connected to sort of journal articles. Um, however, it was still considering the lifespan of JALC and the, the sort of changes, certainly globally, um, when it comes to um, data stewardship. Um, it's since, two, I think you said 2012, was it, that JALC started? Um, I was very surprised at the low number of data that uh, have a DOI. Is that changing? Have you seen, I, I mean, it may not be enough to make a big difference at this moment in time, but have you at least seen an increase more recently of researchers registering DOIs for data um, in Japan? Well, I assume your market is, or the people who are registering these DOIs are predominantly in Japan. And I mean, if you haven't seen that increase, can you, is there a, a reason for it? Is there some sort of underlying um, disconnect with, with researchers that they, they don't want to add DOIs to their data? Or what is JALC doing to encourage this if, they're, if it's not, not happening? Sorry, that's sort of several questions in one, but I hope I, I expressed myself well enough. Yeah, yes, I, I think you, you, you have a several questions to me, but uh, 
Firstly, uh, I, I can see the transition of the numbers of DOIs for research data, and we started 2014, 2015 or 16 to the research data, and it, the number is gradually increasing. Uh, it's, it's amazing for me, too. And uh, under, the, under the JALC or uh, with JALC office, we have uh, another activity, uh, RDUF, Research Data Utilization Forum. So in Japan, we, for example, not, not only this forum, but for example, through this activity, we try to expand the usage of research data. So maybe also, as you, you may know, there are they are changing the policies of journals. Journals gradually uh, increasing to ask researchers to put uh, research data with uh, applying their articles. So there are many environment, uh, environment is changing very much for research data, I think. So uh, JAG also is offering to DOIs for, of JALC DOI, and also we can offer JALC DOI for research data of data side. So in Japan, there are somehow environment is maturing, I think. Mm. But of course, the DOI is registered with data site through JALC was very, very small as well. So Yeah, it's small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, um... It's, I think it's something that, that needs to be discussed maybe between the World Data System and, uh, and JALC. Okay, uh, okay uh, a question from Estelle. So, uh, uh, like a, so, so do most, uh, how, how much, so uh, how many journals is actually so using so uh, ORCID so, uh, for publishing so article in Japan? Yeah, thank, thank you, Takeda Sensei. Uh, it's a um, good, good and bad question, how can I say? Because uh, still uh, uh, we have a J stage, JALC DOI is mostly for uh, J stage journals, and there are very low, low percentage which mm -hmm. have uh, ORCID IDs. So I think we have to communicate with JSTAGE users to ask, use, or collect more ORCID IDs. I can say less than 10% or something like that. So mm. it, it might, it must be, um, we, we, we can, we have to try to attack this, I think. Okay, so uh, how many, how many journals is now so using so JSTAGE? Do you, not, you have number of roughly? Roughly 2,000 or something, I think. Uh, more than 3,000 are registered, but the, the active journals might be between 1,000 and 2,000, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, if I may just want to quickly add, so thank you Masashi for sharing the auto-update feature. I think one of the possible reasons that why it's uh, not really being populated, you know, uh, since it released could be that you know not so many journals start to collect IDs during the workflow. So that's why I'm asking a question and I of course I hope to work with you or of or, or even what data system to see how to improve the use of ORCID and DOS in general in the research workflow. Thank you. Any other questions so now? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Rory, please. Okay. Yeah. So again, um, if uh, any any thoughts come to you while um, while you're listening to this uh, the last talk in our in this first half of the forum, then then uh, oh, sorry the, the workshop, then please um, type them in or raise your hand. Um, so last but not least, um, as I mentioned, we've sort of moved from the uh, persistent identifier of the researcher through to the persistent identifier of digital uh, research uh, outputs and now we're going to move on to to, to physical research outputs 
and um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Jens Klump uh, to, to join us uh, today. He, um, he's um, from the Minerals Resources at the CSIRO in Australia. And Jens today will be introducing uh, the IGSN and, and the title of his talk is uh, the IGSN Global Sample Number, a uh, PID for Physical Objects. Um, so please share your screen and start when you're ready. Thank you, Jens. Thank you very much, Rory. Thank you very much to the organizers of this conference and of this workshop for inviting me to speak. And as Rory already introduced, this is going to be about a persistent identifier for physical objects, also often called samples or specimens. I won't go into the semantic details of what the differences are, but um, it's another type of pit for something that is an interesting and important research output or also research input because samples are the heart of research. We often think of samples in the context of the natural sciences like biology or um, geology, but we also have physical artifacts in many other areas of research in the sciences and also in the arts. And being able to refer to those objects in an unambiguous way is important. So what is the IGSN global sample number? It's a persistent, globally unique, web-resolvable identifier for physical, physical samples and specimens. And you all know about PIDs. And um, so what I want to do in the next few slides is unpack for you what that means in the context of physical objects. It's also important to note that the IGSN is domain agnostic and the samples that we that can refer to can be materials of any kind from anywhere. Um, we are already using this for materials from moon and stardust, so it's not even limited to Earth. So globally unique, what does that mean? In, um, in the, here are two examples on the left-hand side from PetDB, uh, where you have one sample that has been used in and many studies, reanalyzed, and then reappears with about 20 different names. As a reader of these papers, you can't be sure that you're actually reading about the same sample. On the left-hand side, there is a map from generated from EarthChem with samples called M1. M1 obviously isn't a unique name, and it's in this context not very useful to refer to a sample with M1, because it can be just in this bit database. M1 is anything and from anywhere, um, any geological setting. And this pattern repeats in all other disciplines where sample names are often created ad hoc um, or in, uh, in, in the context of a specific collection, but they're not globally unique. Persistent, it's the same problem as with any anything that we refer to with URLs. URLs change over time a phenomenon also called link rot. Um, and having a persistent identifier will then ensure that it always resolves to a landing page, even if the URL of that landing page changes, or even if the URL uh, will be superseded by a future technology. We, just because the internet has been working like this for 30 years, we don't, we shouldn't expect that it does so for the next 100 years. And we certainly want our record of science to last another 100 years minimum. Examples of this we've heard about, like DOI, Handel, ORCID, and, and others. So here's an example of what web resolvable then means. At the, uh, this, this is a screenshot from our um, rock collection and database in Perth in Australia, in the Mineral Resources Unit of CSIRO. And at the top of the page, you can see the very long and cumbersome URL that leads you to the actual page. Um, but that's not what you need to use. You can refer to the sample with its IGSN, which is point, the next arrow, the top arrow points to that IGSN. And underneath is the URL that is used to, to send this 
IGSN to the resolver. It's, you can also put this IGSN into the DOI resolver because handles and DOIs are technically the same thing. And then this redirection sends you to this page and the bottom arrow just points to um, a locally used um, ID that was previously assigned in, in the collection process and would not be uh, globally unique, but is still useful in the, in the local context. But just putting labels on samples isn't really the exciting thing about this. The really exciting thing about persistent identifier systems and, and the uh, metadata is that you can use them to link from one object to another. So in this example, we have a specimen of kaolinite, um, which is identified by an IGSN. And uh, somebody measured a reflectance spectrum on this piece of kaolinite. Um, this was included into a database and uh, this, this data published with the DOI. And then this data has been used for further interpretation in the literature. Uh, it's published in a paper, which is again identified with the DOI. So you can then link from one object to the next. You can also um, add, for instance, orchids to find out from it, or make it easy for a machine to find out who has done what in this research process. What we also use this identifier for is for tracking samples. So it's not just a label in an archive, but for us, it's also like a tracking number in, in other logistic systems. Um, we used it to identify geochemical, we use it to identify soil samples in a geochemical field campaign in the Nullarbor Desert. Um, in South Australia. And in this uh, particular campaign, we had IGSN sample labels that had a pre-printed QR code, which at the moment is, I think, covered for most of you by the, yeah, by the speaker, uh, the, the, the speaker views. Um, but anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a QR code on the label that you can scan with the tablet or phone and then read this QR code into an electronic field notebook and um, use it to pre-populate the fields in this electronic field notebook. And using this streamlined process um, improved the efficiency of sample handling in this campaign by 100%. We could complete this campaign in, within one week instead of two. And you can see the helicopter in the background. Using a helicopter to access the sites is really expensive. So cutting the time in half means really significant uh, savings. Um, historically, IGSN grew out of the geological sciences, but is now used for any kind of physical samples that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, we've recently crossed the 8 million samples mark, uh, but we expect that the system could grow to 3 billion samples over the next 10 years when um, large national collections um, come on board. So the question is, how do we grow the system to accommodate the scale? Um, metadata is a really important question in this context because just having the number doesn't really tell you that much. But the challenge, if something is anything from anywhere in the universe, what is the least common denominator to make the description of this object um, to make it findable and reusable as elements of fair. So the description certainly will depend on its intended use, um, but we have to find a way to have this uh, flexible because if the least common denominator is too narrow, then the description itself is useless. If it's too prescriptive, it becomes useless for many cases and will only serve very, a very narrow set of use cases. So, but there have been really good technical developments over the last couple of years that let the machines do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. And what persistent identifiers can do for us is to pro provide anchors to people, publications, data, code, samples, instruments, etc. And with metadata becoming machine readable, they can also be harvested by standard web technologies. 
And we can see that linked data is finally coming of age um, if it's done at scale and if it's not done manually. So we've seen sandbox examples in the past that all look very nice, but never translated into, into reality, but now we're getting there. So what we can, what we have here um, is that we can um, identify and describe um, all sorts of objects with IGSN and associate, for instance, an ORCID with it to um, make it obvious who is the originator of this specimen, who is the curator of the specimen, who has any rights to the specimen. Then we can link this to code, data, other um, um, digital objects that are identified by the OI and can also be attributed with ORCID. And eventually, as I mentioned earlier, we can then link all of this to publications or other uh, higher value research outputs. Um, again, identified with the OI and, and attributed through ORCID. I mentioned web technologies and search engines and uh, I'd just wanted to give a very quick one minute introduction to how search engines work because that's important for the next step. So search engines work by having a map of a part of the internet that they use to crawl across all the sites of interest. Of interest. And then in the next step, what they do is they scrape the data of those pages and index them into a database. So these two, um, that's those two steps, the crawling and the scraping. And this is what we propose for um, the next phase of IGSN to be able to scale to billions of samples, which is then um, similar to the billions of pages on the internet. So to do that, um, we, um, we borrow from what search engine operates develop, schema.org and sitemaps. Um, sitemaps is a way to direct the crawlers to the pages that they should be indexing and schema.org is a way to um, structure and annotate um, the, whatever is in that page in a machine readable way. And there's a flavor of that for um, science purposes with do, um, domain specific um, applications. And so what that means is that in future metadata will be embedded in landing pages as JSON LD elements and the crawlers find those pages through sitemaps and sitemaps of sitemaps. Um, the good thing is that there are plenty of software libraries around to deal with harvesting and passing of JSON LD to make this um, implementation easier than the old way of doing that with OAI PMH. And using technologies like JSON API also allows us to do selective harvesting of metadata elements so that um, the data extracted in the uh, harvesting process can be used in, uh, in a more targeted way than having to digest everything. And as I mentioned, linked data is coming of age. So the JSON LD um, um, the technology provides a framework for encoding a metadata in a semantic way. And then these uh, metadata, what we can also do is generate these metadata using machines. Um, so we don't have to type them in manually. We, a, a simple way was what I mentioned earlier with our electronic field notebooks, and then use PIDs as anchors of these metadata and associated objects into the real world. These relationships between the objects and, and concepts uh, can be portrayed as graphs. A, a graph in a mathematical sense is, is an association of two, uh, what they call nodes through an edge. Um, and the, um, the machine learning is one of the ways that can be applied to analyze those graphs and get additional meaning out of them. Um, so graphs can be analyzed through algorithmic methods like pattern recognition, reasoning, etc. And um, 
in this example to the uh, left, this is a map of literature relationships of um, fossils that Robert Huber and myself analyzed a while back. And what we were able to do through graph analysis was to reconstruct the research, the science consensus on um, how these um, fossils are named, what the, their taxonomic names are. This is usually considered expert knowledge, but we were able to demonstrate that graph analysis can get a long way in doing this algorithmically. So um, again, with like with any other machine learning techniques, having more training data, better training data in the end um, leads to better results. Um, and we first saw this in image analysis and natural language processing, but in the long run, we can see we can expect to see similar developments in graph-based learning. Why is this exciting? Because it enables us through the exposed metadata to do new research. So on the left-hand side is the old Streckeisen diagram of the classification of igneous rocks, which was used to pigeonhole um, um, igneous rocks, rocks from kind of volcanic process or magma what of any kind into a system. Um, and it doesn't tell you much. It, it doesn't tell you about any, any context or relationship. It's just a pigeonhole system. But if you then um, use multidimensional analysis and, and encode that as a graph, as done by Histat et al. in the paper from 2019, you can then see um, rock mineral types um, cluster into families and their chemical properties cluster into families and you can start seeing the relationships and you can start asking questions like how are my samples related? Um, how are my mineral samples influencing groundwater chemistry? And through the influence on groundwater chemistry, what are the interactions with the soil microbiome? Those are uh, questions that would be very difficult to answer by just analyzing tables. So in, in summary, um, physical samples are at the heart of many research disciplines. And what IGSN allows us to do is to persistently identify physical samples across institutional boundaries. And through linking IGSN with DOI of data and literature, physical samples are linked to the scholarly communication and become part of the record of science. And linking samples to the research knowledge graph enables insights by analyzing samples, data and literature in contexts that would otherwise not be possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jens. That was that's very very interesting. Um, Takeda San and, and Mori San. Okay. Um, any questions? Um, okay. Um, well, um, yeah. I was going to say again. I have one, but I think I wondered if this was of interest to you, Takeda San. I wondered if your eyes lit up when you heard the word linked open data, because I know yeah. that this is a personal interest of yours. <laughs> Yes, yes, um, yeah. I'm uh, also an so expert of the Semant Web, so uh, yeah, I'm very interested in this whole world. So, uh, world. so uh, yeah, so uh, my, my question is that uh, uh, you have uh, already some sort of taxonomy is, is or, or more generally in the uh, vocabulary. Is that, is that, is that you have some standard so taxonomy or vocabulary? So, because uh, if we want so link so uh, uh, such so uh, entity to the other, so probably so such so standardized knowledge is very important. The power situation in a physical object. Absolutely, that that is a key question. And um, so, we have developed a, uh, a standard description for mm -hmm. earth and environmental samples, and this mm -hmm. standard description, what we propose as a standard description. Mm -hmm. Um, relies almost entirely on pre-existing vocabularies. 
because as you said, if we want to link to other other fields or our previous or other work, we sh we need to use the same taxonomies, and um, we only had to add our own extension to that taxonomy to describe the relationships of the persistent identifiers to objects and to each other, because that wasn't covered in the um, existing uh, geological and biological uh, taxonomies. And, and this pattern, I expect that this pattern will repeat in other disciplines, that when we describe archaeology, um, arch archaeological artifacts, that there will be an archaeological taxonomy to describe um, archaeological artifacts on the web. That in material sciences, there will be a, a, a kind of analog taxonomy to describe their samples on the net. Um, what I think will not really happen, is, well, will, will happen only at a higher level is the crossover because there's you can make crossovers between disciplines, but they're not always useful. and They have to come out of an application. But asking what is the, what is the pre um, preferred way or recommended way to describe an object and, and then this way make it discoverable and linkable to other works, that is a really important question. Thank you very much. So that, that means so, uh that's so I IDSN so uh, community so, so each such a field have our own uh, maintaining own taxonomy. Is that, is that right? That is a proposal. It's we we are uh, as I said we are in a process of scaling up the system from being a fairly domain specific operation to something that is uh, across domains and. One, you did, it, my idea is that it should work in the way that you just described, that there will be different, what I call communities of practice that then agree on how they want to describe their objects and, um, and what the best practices are in, in doing that. Hmm. Okay, yeah. I have another question from uh, uh, IGN. Uh, common outside uh, geology. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a, another uh, question from Brian. Uh, how common is IGSN uh, out of our uh, use outside of uh, the geology field? So it's it's not used much outside of the biological oh. community outside of the geological community yet. That's where it historically originated. But um, CSRO as a research organization, as, as, and as Australia's research organization, mm -hmm. um, intends to use um, IGSN as the one persistent identifier system for all its physical specimens across all 52 curated collections that exist of some of them are national collections. So through this adoption, um, the use of IGSN will move into other disciplines. We have emerging uses in, in other disciplines um, already, um, like archaeology. Um, and then in, in the US, there are also um, uh, cross-disciplinary uh, projects like iSamples that uh, operate in the life sciences and archaeology mm -hmm. and I think material sciences that um, I th think these these um, kind of projects will be instrumental in, in bro broadening the use of IGSN. Okay, um, okay uh, so last question from uh, do you have any uh, 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 you working? Do you have any working about the uh, direction of the Scorix? Okay, so, uh, we we have been in touch with Scorix. Um, 
and we want to intensify that collaboration. So, so far it's been a discussion, but not a technical link, um, which had to do with certain um, things in very deep down in how the internet works and, and certificates. And I don't, I won't bore you now with the details. So it's something that um, we definitely um, want to continue and, and because Golix uh, plays such an important role in, in linking all these elements of the record of science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, maybe so we can, we can, so now, so we stop, so uh, question for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, uh, for Jim. So then we have, we, had, we are going to the general discussion. So with uh, all three presenters. So, uh, so, um, so uh, um, okay. So uh, now, so uh, any so uh, uh, question about or any topic? So uh, uh, we can share with the three presenters, or even so. Uh, okay, again, okay. I can ask so three presenters. So any, uh, do you have any question to other presenters? Hi, it's Estelle. I actually, I have a question for Rory. <laughs> I mean, it's more from, you know, to ask for, I would like to know more from WDS perspective. So if you don't mind, just, just quickly comment. I think in yesterday's WDS member forum, it, uh, so Alex did mention about uh, a distinction between general repositories versus domain specific repositories, if I remember correctly. So I'm just wondering, as I, as I share that ORCID is quite established in general repositories, at least some of them. I'm just curious, would you mind to elaborate a bit more of the progress or the um, development for pits like ORCID or others in those domain specific repositories? Thank you. So, I mean, from a WDS perspective, we think that, that um, permanent identifier or persistent identifiers should um, absolutely be um, applied to, to, to data. Um, there has obviously been some arguments uh, as to the granularity that, that um, persistent identifiers should be, um, should be added. And I think that's a, more of a community discussion, but I think from a, from a WDS perspective, we absolutely think that, that um, the PID should be um, added to, uh, to, to data um, as much as anything else because of um, uh, making sure that uh, the data is citable, um, uh, making sure that there is uh, adequate acknowledgement and recognition for the, those involved in the process, the stewardship process, which uh, don't always get the, the acknowledgement that they they should, um, and also of the, the data collectors themselves. Um, I think as um, so it, when it comes to core trust seal, we certain uh, with the certification standard um, asks really as part of the again the sort of reuse of, of data whether you're using um, persistent identifiers and, and and mainly in this case is talking about um, uh, digital object identifiers, but of course it doesn't preclude. Um, other identifiers such as orchids. I think um, we we believe that you know um, as as Martin will show in the second half that you know that that, that sort of the power of having all of these different types of um, persistent identifiers um, you know it really sort of enriches um, one's understanding of the the, the sort of the, the knowledge landscape. Um, to create these sort of knowledge graphs, knowledge networks. So I think um, that that's sort of some of the interest that, that, that WDS has. The point that was being raised yesterday um, about generalized or generalist repositories versus domain repositories um, was the issue that um, if, well, be, be, you should only have one type of persistent identifier for one object. So if you have a, a data set, it should only have one DOI. And the problem is that if someone is at a, in a first instance going to a generalist repository and depositing their data because it's 
simple or easy or however, for whatever reason they want to do it, and they get a persistent identifier associated with it, if they then move that, if they then also register, want to register that data set or to deposit that data set later on into a domain repository, which might be insisted upon by a journal or it might be insisted on by a, you know, um, a funder or what have you, um, there are, can be issues because that means that the domain data repository can't actually accept those data or can't um, do any, really anything with those data because it already has a persistent identifier associated with it from the generous repository. So this, the, I think that, that that's mainly, that's sort of simplifying it a bit, I think, but that was where some of those those uh, issues were, were coming from. Um, uh, I hope that somewhat <laughs> answers your question, but I'm not sure if it does entirely, Estelle. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think clarifies a little bit. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, related to uh, uh, Estelle's question, so um, I think so. The, okay, DOI is a uh, even so DOI must be a uh, DOI or PID must be so uh, uh, keep unique, even so uh, uh, domain repository uh, or even general repository, even in any other repository. But so probably the difference may, may occur in the metadata. So uh, that's uh, that's uh, that matter that I asked so in so. Uh, Gene about so uh, like a taxonomy in uh, 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 I, 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 IGSN. So uh, in so um, one specific so uh, one uh, like, uh, uh, domain repository. So that so they may use uh, own uh, metadata with uh, so unique uh, the ID the ID. That so uh, I think so an uh, ID is uh, of course one key element of. Uh, data sharing and uh, data reuse and uh, metadata is uh, another key element so uh, about uh, the sharing so uh, that is a that is a very interesting point like uh, some some general repository and uh, uh, domain space repository i think so even so it's a very important issue so uh, for all three presenters here so uh, like a, uh, do you have any comments so about such uh, metadata uh, description? So, uh, uh, okay, uh, may I ask the Jean? So, have you have comments? Okay. How to realize so uh, sharing so uh, across the uh, uh, cross domain or across uh, a field? What the, the way I see sharing metadata is always centered around use cases. Uh, that's why I'd like to use this image of an unlabeled tin can to illustrate that point. When you have this tin can, you ask, you can ask many questions. You can ask, what, what's the content? What is the sell by date? What is the supply chain logistics? Is the inside coating BPA free? All of these questions depend very much on the context. When you're at the cashier to pay, the supply chain or BPA coating doesn't matter. But when you want to recycle it, you want to know about the metallurgy. If you want to know about its, its mechanical properties, when you want to stack them. Um, but um, packing everything into, into a common description also makes a very prescriptive use case. And mm. So, it's it's. I find it very difficult to say what is the right set of metadata. Mm. It I would always say metadata is about the communication process between a sender and the receiver, and they have to agree on what they want to communicate. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay. Um... Another question for, for Esther is, uh, so ORCID, uh, so now so uh, keeping some profile for the uh, uh, researcher, so uh, that's so, uh, how such a, okay, ID linking is uh, one, one so uh, uh, method, so uh, 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 over, over uh, how to find so relationship between the different so uh, data, uh, digital objects, so how about such a uh, metadata, the use of metadata, so uh, uh, across uh, uh, research disciplines. So, do you have any uh, 
uh, idea. So just 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 use a sharing idea. Uh, just we also uh, reuse ID. So, so have any any idea about the uh, sharing or use of metadata? Yeah, thank you, Takeda. I think it's only uh, it's also a good question. So I think um, as you may know, Orchid serves a hub and a repository. I mean, Orchid serves as a information hub. So the metadata actually is con has been contributed by the community instead of Orchid directly. So I think the way is more you know to better really use or standardize metadata relies on the community effort through different organizations really trying to connect validated data and to enable that to be circulated. And I know there has been conversations for a very preliminary trying to see if there is a way to uh, employ the metadata at ORCID as somehow, you know, some, as a, a way of trying to um, improve the quality of metadata in general, I mean, sorry, communications, but probably the conversation is very early, it's just beginning. So, so far, they are still under a very early stage discussion. But I will say it's more about, you know, that's why we always encourage member of the nations to really use the benefits to um, connect validated data information and trying to use that to really benefit yourself. I think that would be my answer to your question. Hope I do answer your question. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, time is running up. So, uh, any further questions? Okay. So good. So, uh, Rory. So, uh, maybe so we um, stop so this session. Yeah. So, um, I want to thank um, all of the speakers again. I think um, those were three very, very interesting talks personally. And I have some questions, but I, <laughs> um, I will find a way to ask those offline. Um, and so now, um, I, I, after again thanking the speakers, I'd just uh, like to just, uh, wrap up this, this session. Um, and we will start again at 20 to the hour. Um, so we've got 20 minutes um, almost, or 19 minutes now, just to have a quick break, stretch your legs, get some air, and we hope to have you back here for the second half of the session, where we will start looking at some practical use cases of, of, uh, of, of PIDs. So thank you very much for joining us, and, and we'll see you in about uh, 18 minutes now. Thank you.